Thank you for joining us for our third quarter outlook. You may recall we began the year with a weather-related swoon for both the U.S. economy and the stock market. Unfortunately, last quarter saw a rebound in both, such that the title for this quarter's outlook is back on track, reflecting our belief that the economy and the capital markets are back on the course that we outlined for what we expected in January for this year as a whole. If you take a look at the U.S. economy across uh, economic indicators, most of them look very similar to here what we see at least portrayed on the PMI, which is the Purchasing Managers Index, which is a measure of manufacturing health. And namely, what you see is the winter, a precipitous drop off, and then a rebound last quarter, what we're calling here a thawn. As you may recall, our outlook last quarter is called Spring Thawn. We've really seen that across measures, whether it's retail sales or auto sales, home, home builders index and consumer confidence, they all look similar in that the second quarter they enjoyed a nice rebound. Of course, no, no discussion about the U.S. economy is, is complete without perhaps the most important indicator, and that is some measure of the health of the labor market. And the most common measure, of course, is the unemployment rate here known as the U3 in green. And it has fallen pretty steadily since 2009. The most recent reading here that we got last week has seen the unemployment rate fall to 6.1% long ways from the pain of 10% unemployment back in 2009. Perhaps even more impressive is this recovery in the jobs market has been kind of stealthy in it, how broad-based it is. In fact, last week we got a labor diffusion index that was the highest in 14 years. And what that measures is how many different industries are adding jobs. And what we saw was the biggest number of industries from all the services to, into manufacturing adding jobs more than we've seen since the first quarter of 2000. So it's, it's a broad-based, though slow, uh, rebound in jobs. It, it's very, very broad-based, and that's obviously very encouraging. One thing that people have said is that the 6.1 percent unemployment rate really understates the, the pain in the unemployment market, and that's, that's certainly true. Here we take a look at trying to give you some context by looking at what's known as the U6 which is a broader based measure of unemployment. It takes not only the U3, which is people that are unemployed and looking for work, but it also adds those that are unemployed and not looking and those that are employed part-time and would rather have a full-time job. And it's a reading that's about twice as high as the unemployment rate. But the fact is that it's gone down in a very parallel fashion, very slow and steady. But the fact is that this job market is getting better and it is broadening out, which is very encouraging. Uh, as the economy gets better, uh, we think we're going to see more sort of um, mounting inflationary pressures. We say this not because we think inflation is going to be a problem, but rather because we think that we've seen the low in interest rates. And here, and the blue line indicates uh, the core CPI shelter component. In other words, housing, which is the largest component of CPI, it represents about 40% of CPI, and it continues to trend up. And being the largest component, that obviously gets our attention. However, the non-shelter core components of CPI had been going the opposite direction until the last few months when they too have started to hook up. So in aggregate we think inflation has bottomed. We think that interest rates on balance are going to finally start trending up, but again very slowly because there's a number of factors that are keeping them low. One of the most confounding factors is the fact that we've seen the Fed taper, in other words scale back their monthly purchases of treasuries. They've had four different taper uh, episodes now starting back in December of last year. Uh, now they're purchasing, then they were purchasing 85 billion uh, a month and now they're purchasing only 45 billion, yet interest rates have stayed low when there's less, almost half demand on the part of the Treasury than there was back in December. And why is that? Well, the blue line attempts to answer that. What we're looking here is at the rolling six month average of taking how many. Uh, treasuries are issued on a monthly basis relative to how much is purchased on a monthly basis on the, in the market by the Fed. And ironically, when the Fed started purchasing, at least scaling back the purchases in December, they were purchasing about 50% of the issuance on a monthly basis. And now after they scaled back four times to purchase half as much, they're purchasing a higher percentage of the outstanding. Why is that? Because as the subheading says, the economy has rebounded such that our deficit has improved that the Fed issuance has dropped faster than the taper. So ironically, even though the Fed's tapered dramatically, they're still buying a higher percentage of the outstanding treasuries on a monthly basis. So this is something that as the economy, it's kind of good news, bad news, as the economy gets better, the Fed's still buying 
a high percentage of treasuries outstanding, all things being equal, serving to keep a bit of a lid on how rapidly rates would otherwise rise. Another thing that's helping to keep a, a lid on interest rates is the global rate complex. In a world that's struggling for growth, interest rates are very low as economies and countries and central banks try to stimulate their growth. Here we take a look at yields on 10-year instruments for, in this case, the red line shows the 10-year U.S. Treasury yielding a little over 2.5%. At the same time, the German 10 years yielding about half that at 121, and even more surprising is two former pigs, Italy and Spain, are trading almost on top of the U.S., trading around 2.7. Really surprising, but as these economies and countries cut rates, take unconventional means to try to stimulate growth, uh, you have low rates around the world, and who's going to buy 10-year paper in Italy and Spain for 270 when they can buy U.S. paper at 2.5? So, again, Global flows of funds are also helping to keep rates lower than they otherwise would be in the U.S. at the point in time. Still, our interest rate outlook is for rates to trend higher. As a reminder, the yield curve at the beginning of the year looked like this, with the yield on the 10-year at 3%. As we ended last quarter on June 30, it had fallen to two, a little over 2.5%. Our expectation is that the 10-year will tick up to over 3%, maybe three and a quarter by the time the year ends given the strength of the economy, just a slow grind higher in rates. As far as the world and how we're allocating capital, very simplistically trying to wor divide the world into quartiles. Here on the, on the x-axis, we look at GDP growth. Slow growers are anything less than 3% GDP growth. Anything greater than that would be high growth. And then inflation on the y-axis, 3% and low, lower is low inflation and above 3% is high inflation. So you have you have quartiles here. The place you don't want to be is in the northwest quadrant, right? You have low growth and high inflation. The sweet spot is here with high growth and low inflation. And if you overlay some of the major parts of the world here, you see a couple of things. First of all, places you don't want to be, the former BRICS stars here, Russia and Brazil, they're suffering from low growth, high inflation, which limits the monetary options they have because they have to worry about inflation becoming even more problematic. Uh, on the other hand, China seems like they're in a real sweet spot here, high growth, low inflation, but the concern there, of course, is that their growth rates have been slowing from out here down to here, and the, the concern is how much slower will they get. The emerging markets, many of them are in the high growth, high inflation, and selectively we like areas. One of the most notable ones would be India. Uh, take a look at our market letter for a piece uh, from our colleague Dean Dordovic this, this quarter on that. And then all the developed world is really crowded into here, into the southwest quadrant where there's low growth, but there's also low inflation, which leaves lots of options open on the part of the central banks to try to stimulate, to drive their growth rates out this direction here. So we'll see how successful they can be. But of course, our favorite market at the beginning there was the U.S. market. That's still the case here as we progress into the third quarter. As far as the stock market that's trading at or near all-time highs, a good question is, how high is too high? To try to answer that, we take a look at forward earnings per share here on the S&P 500. And though the S&P is up about 200% off its lows, earnings are up dramatically too. And therefore, if you overlay what the P-E ratio looks like over the same time frame, though the market went up, call it almost a double over this time frame, P-E ratio hasn't gone up that much. I mean, it's, certainly it's up off its lows of 10 and 11 times earnings to now trading about 15 and a half times earnings. So we're certainly not arguing that the market is cheap. The point is that as earnings have grown, uh, these multiples have been justified and we're keeping an eye on earnings growth uh, as a measure for whether these multiples are going to be sustainable or not. But for the time being, we're sticking with our forecast of the equity market to continue to, to trend higher as earnings continue to rebound with the economy rebounding. Another thing that we think will hopefully happen here in the second half of the year is that as more investors get confidence that the economic uh, rebound is sustainable, that we'll see more funds come off the sidelines, not only from the fixed income market, but also from uh, cash stores and go into the equity markets, at which point uh, we'll, we'll be more inclined to take money out of our asset allocation towards equities. But for the time being, we believe that the, the economic uh, trajectory and the valuation support higher equity prices from here. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Hope you have a great summer, and we look forward to catching up with you in the fall.